Nature-based solutions are important. They, don't, they can't solve the problem of overheating in cities, but they have a role to play. But undoubtedly, they are unevenly distributed across cities, particularly when you take account of uh, people's gardens and their backyards and their own spaces, private spaces as well as public spaces. So um, there are real issues with the ability that different people have to access those spaces. There's certainly a danger that as cities are developed and they talk about um, develop, de development which is greener and more sustainable and more livable, that that all happens in sort of middle class areas where you get these sort of gentrification effects happening therefore, where you know, poorer communities are pushed out of the city, they are left in areas that don't have those sort of green and sustainable qualities and it's the middle classes that get to benefit from that. So there is a real danger of sort of exclude, ex exclusion happening during the processes of improving the cities, in, including in terms of greening them. So the sorts of things that can be done to sort of guard against that and try and get this idea of cool green inclusion would be to prioritise the development, maintenance and improvement of green and blue spaces in poorer areas, using opportunities where development projects are happening, are, are, are happening to um, make sure the case is made for not just more and more intensive development, but actually keeping some of that space for the public good and for greening. Um, also uh, making sure that communities sort of can, can fight for the spaces that they value. And there's some great examples um, from all sorts of cities that I'm familiar with of where communities have, have, have sort of pushed back against big development projects said this is public space, this is green space that we, we need, we value, we're going to need more of in, under climate change and successfully sort of won some of those battles. In my own city there's an example of, of a community that did that and then was able to, to eventually own the land that they protected and turn it into a community nature reserve and it's sort of protected for the future for the local people to use and that was really really important during COVID and lockdown where people needed to get out of their homes and one of the place, places that got used enormously was that sort of the area that was protected by the community, managed by the community and made to sort of be a meaningful space for them. And during heat waves, absolutely really important to have those sorts of opportunities available to people. I think that's the case to some degree. Um, it's certainly true that heat waves are something that we can feel very directly. And obviously the media makes a big deal about them, particularly when temperature records are being broken and so on. So certainly this year, I think um, heat waves have been very sort of real to people, um, many people in many parts of the world. And that has helped bring home that climate change really is happening. I think there are some things that push, still push back against that. I don't know if, what it's like in Belgium, but certainly in the UK, when heat waves are approaching, the news reports can't help but have pictures of people on the beach, people enjoying it. You know, phew, what a swell, what a swelter is one of the phrases that may not translate very well, but it's a sort of typical phrase the media come out with which is saying, great, it's a heat wave, how lovely, we're all going to enjoy it. So we've still got to get away from the difference between lovely, pleasant, nice, warm weather and extreme heat. I, to some degree, wa worry about whether this focus on breaking temperature records can end up being a problem. So, you know, if we don't carry on breaking the record, will the media get disinterested because, they're, you know, they get obsessed with that. But you know, these things can still be really damaging and harmful, but if they're not as quite as high as they were last year, then the, is the media going to be as interested? And also the deaths that do happen during heat waves are not very self-evident, they're not very visible actually, because the thousands of deaths that for example happened 
in the UK um, in August this year were largely amongst older people. You only see the statistics in the, in the excess death certificates, which only sort of get, get reported often several months after when, when the heat wave has happened. There's ways in which heat waves can help make us realise what's going on, but I think there's still some invisibilities there as well. Clearly one way of, of uh, keeping temperatures down in our homes, in offices, in, in transport systems and so on is to use air conditioning. Air conditioning uses lots of energy at the moment that adds to carbon emissions and it fuels the problem in the first place. So you've got this sort of um, regressive effect going on. Um, I mean, air conditioning has gradually been finding, it's been creeping into the UK through various routes. So offices are now routinely air conditioned and it's part of how you know, luxury offices are sold because of the, the air conditioning they have. Um, we looked at the, uh, a tenfold growth in air conditioning that had, that had happened in our local hospital. And we were sort of thinking, why on earth has this happened? It was just over a sort of 10 year period. And um, it wasn't climate change because we hadn't at that point experienced anything like the temperatures that we're now experiencing. But it was a lot to do with how the, how the hospital was operating, the, the technologies they were using, and when you use technologies, they often generate heat, so the computer server room that had to be kept cold, the, the, the store for medicines had to keep, be kept at certain temperatures because they were dealing with medicines that were sensitive to, to temperature levels, and a whole range of different explanations that provided a rationale for why you needed air conditioning. We've also seen air conditioning become completely normal in cars over a very short period of time, which hasn't, doesn't, again, doesn't have anything to do with the changing climate. So there are these all sorts of different things that have sort of contributed to the rise of air conditioning already. In the UK, it hasn't really routinely got into people's homes as yet. And there's a real danger that it starts to become a normal part of domestic life and a part of selling a house and so on. I think in the high end of a property market it's there, but there's a real danger that it gradually moves down through the rest. How do you resist that? Well, there are lots of ways of achieving cooling um, in domestic settings without air conditioning. Um, there's a lot that can be done with building, building design to, to build in passive forms of cooling and ventilation. There's a lot that we can do to, to help people understand how to manage the thermal um, environment in their own homes, in terms of how you use curtains and windows and so on, particularly during hot, really hot weather. Um, we could do things like um, put extra taxes on air conditioning to, to discourage, to make them more expensive. Um, we, could, we could actually ban the use of air conditioning as something that's built into new developments. So, you know, if we really decided that air conditioning wasn't something that we, that, we, that we should be moving towards, I think there's a whole range of policy measures that could be brought into operation. But I think there's still some settings where you need to think about the most vulnerable. So, for example, hospitals, for example, care homes for older people. Then in some of those settings, I think air conditioning may be justified, certainly as an emergency measure with air conditioning units bought in to, to, to keep a cooled environment for people um, where they're particularly vulnerable. But we need to do everything I think we can to sort of resist the move into the sort of Western Northern European um, domestic settings of, of air conditioning as a technology. It's really interesting to think about citizen science in relation to urban heating. It's not something that I've particularly seen happening. Um, it's not something that I've directly got involved in. But I, reflecting on it, I think there's a lot of potential in there. Um, I can imagine people monitoring heat levels in their homes in a, you know, in a very distributed way. You'd suddenly generate a lot of data on the variation of temperature levels in people's homes. Um, which could be really interesting to see how some people are able to keep their homes cooler and other people are not. 
think that could be very revealing. You could do a lot on green spaces, asking people to um, keep track of the use of green spaces during heat wave periods, um, uh, what the quality of the sort of shading is, um, keeping, um, you know, monitoring whether there are, there's sort of tree damage happening and loss of, loss of leaf cover and things like that, those sorts of sort of ongoing monitoring of the, of the quality of green infrastructure can be really, I could imagine, could be really effective. We did um, one project I was involved with, uh, which was a quite amazing project in terms of the data it collected. Um, it was with outdoor, uh, I'll get to the point in a moment, but it was with outdoor mine workers in Australia who were working in extraordinarily hot conditions, labouring very hard. And one of the data, types of data that was collected was that the miners were asked to ingest a, a temperature monitor, a sort of probe into their system so that you can actually track what, what was going on in a lot of detail in their bodies in terms of their core temperature. Maybe you could do that with citizen scientists. Uh, I don't entirely know about the ethics and the costs and so on. But Again, then you could be looking at what's actually going on in, inside people's bodies in relation to the temperatures that they're exposed to. And that's one of the, clearly one of the crucial things we need to keep track of because that's where the harm starts to really be felt. Um, but one of the real problems with researching heat waves, which is something that we encountered, was that you don't know when they're going to happen. And even so, you know, you don't get much notice, you don't much get much warning. So it's quite difficult to sort of do the practicalities of research for something like that. This, my interest in this came from um, supervising a PhD student who was, he wanted to do his PhD on something to do with environmental justice. And he couldn't settle on the thing that was going to be his focus. And in the end, I remember him coming to me and saying, I've been looking at heat waves and looking at statistics on the location of death of people during heat waves. And what was really striking was that when you looked at the location data, so was, was it at home, was it in hospital, um, the, the, the category of location that had the biggest percentage increase was care homes, sort of nursing residential homes for older people, which intuitively, sort of didn't make, it sort of made you go, well, why on earth is that the case? These are, these are care homes. They're meant to be providing care for people. People should be able to, to survive a, a heat wave. Um, even if they're old and frail and vulner particularly vulnerable to, to, to heat because of their pre-existing health conditions, in a care setting, you would expect them to be ready and to be able to respond and ready, ready to act and so on, in, in principle, that is. One striking thing we found was, a, was, was a, a sort of cultural thing, which certainly is very true in the UK, which is an obsession with keeping older people warm. So we have culturally deeply embedded that if you're old, uh, a threat to your health and your well-being is, by, is being too cold. And that's certainly true. You know, we need to keep older people warm during, during the winter. The bodies don't thermoregulate as well. But what was happening was that that sort of all pervasive, very powerful, dominant discourse for the running of care homes was still there even in hot weather, even during, you know, really when you're getting towards heat wave periods. So when we were doing the research, you'd find heating systems still on during, entirely during the summer. You'd find the sort of routines of eating and dressing and giving people cups of tea were exactly the same during hot weather as during the cold weather. And, and you know, care, in a way, we didn't want to be too critical of what the care staff were doing because they're doing really difficult jobs. They're, they're very low paid, um, you know, they're very difficult sector in the UK. And, um, you know, you can understand why they run on a routine. They just do things to get by every day. And, but what, what wasn't happening was somebody saying, wait a minute, all those routines need to change. We need to identify the particularly sensitive people in the care home, do things to really look after them during this sort of two or three day period. And, you know, recognize we're in an emergency situation, not a normal situation. 
and try and get over this obsession with, with the cold as a threat and not, the, not heat as a threat. Um, so the, there were a whole load of other things to do with um, building design and um, the use of ventilation, windows not being openable and the way that the heating system was controlled, all sorts of things that we found that were, were problematic in, in the care, case study care, care homes that we looked at. And we managed, you know, we, we produced a report and this is one occasion where research that we did actually had a consequence. We managed to get new guidance produced by the government for front frontline staff in care homes, um, advising them specifically what they should be seeking to do during, during uh, heat waves. And one of the things in there was it says, make sure the heating system is off. How's it going so far? <laughs>